In this video, we'll talk about the assumptions behind linear regression models. In terms of the overall structure of our course, we're in the phase where we focus on the supervised learning task of regression, that is, modeling a quantitative response variable. We'll focus first on evaluating models so that when we move to methods for building models, we know what qualities are desirable in good ones. Thinking about model evaluation is motivated nicely by a famous quote by the British statistician George Box. He said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. This quote may seem a little bleak, but we should ask ourselves, what does make a model useful? When considering a model's utility, we should consider a few things. First, does the model meet the assumptions required for its use? We ask this question because many methods rely on some conditions being met for their outputs to be valid. If it turns out that key assumptions were not met in building the model, the inferences we made from our model might not be very reliable. Second, how much variation in the response variable does the model explain? We want good, useful models to explain a lot of variation in the response. That is, we want our models to tell us why our cases are different. If the responses are highly variable and we don't know why from our modeling, we haven't learned much. Third, how accurate are predictions from the model? When we build models from data, we often want to use them to make predictions about situations we have not seen before. This prediction viewpoint is at the heart of machine learning and is a different view from descriptive modeling, which focuses on describing how the world works. In a descriptive viewpoint, we usually focus on the interpretations of the coefficients. In a predictive viewpoint, we care a lot about quantifying the predictive accuracy of our model on new cases. We'll focus on question one in this video and get to questions two and three in the next. In this video, we'll be talking about the assumptions of linear regression, so let's first review the notation we use to write down or to express linear regression models. We have n cases in our data set, and for each case i, we measure the response or outcome variable yi. We also measure p predictor variables xi1 through xip. A multiple linear regression model can be used to model the response y as a function of the predictors as shown here. We express the response variable y as a weighted sum of the predictors, also called a linear combination, plus an error term, also called a residual. We denote this error term, or residual, with the Greek letter epsilon. This model says that on average, we can predict y with a linear combination of the predictors, but the individual responses differ from our prediction by the residual. To use a concrete data example, we'll look at housing data from upstate New York. We're interested in the relationship between house price and house age, and we visualize this relationship with a scatter plot. We add a smooth trend in blue to the plot, and we see that there looks to be a linear decrease in price with increasing age at the beginning, but the relationship seems to flatten out. We also add a red linear trend line to show what a simple linear regression model of price on age would look like. We fit this model and display the summarized output on the right. Given what we saw in our visualization, we, not, we might not expect this to be the most ideal model since the trend looks like it blends out. But we will examine this model to illustrate some key ideas. We see from the model output that on average, a new house is worth about $230,000. This is conveyed by the intercept. Also, on average, house prices decrease by about $640 per year of age. This comes from the estimated coefficient for age. Let's start evaluating the quality of this model by examining whether the assumptions of linear regression are met. What are those assumptions? When we use linear regression, we assume that the error terms, the residuals, are statistically independent and normally distributed with mean zero and common variance sigma squared. In particular, we rely on these assumptions for statistical inference. That is, when we use test statistics, p-values, and confidence intervals that result from linear regression models. The mathematical notation for this assumption is shown at the bottom. The tilde sign means is distributed as. The capital N stands for the normal distribution, and the two entries inside the parentheses 
indicate the two parameters that define the center and spread of the normal distribution. The first entry, zero, is the mean, and the second entry, sigma squared, defines the variance, or the spread of the normal distribution. Let's unpack this assumption. We can break this assumption down into four pieces, independence, trend, homoscedasticity, and normality. Let's go through each of these in more detail. The first part of the assumption is that the residuals, the errors in linear regression, are statistically independent. A formal mathematical definition of statistical independence is best saved for our upper level probability class, but you can think of independence conceptually as saying that the probability of one event A happening does not depend on whether or not some other event B happened. For example, we could say that flips of a coin are independent. The event of flipping heads on my second flip is not affected by the tails that I got on the first flip. Similarly, we could also say that rolls of a single die are independent. The event of me rolling a three on my second roll is not affected by the two that I rolled on the first. The independence assumption for linear regression says that the amount of error for case I should not depend on the errors for the other cases in the data set. For example, the probability of getting a residual of three for case one should not be affected by the values of the residuals for the other cases. When might the independence assumption be violated? In situations where we would expect the data to be correlated. For example, learning outcomes of students in a single classroom are not likely to be independent because they all have the same teacher. Also, measurements that are collected on an individual over time, longitudinal measurements, are certainly correlated because they're being measured on the same person. As a concrete example, consider body weight. My body weight measurements over time are going to be related to each other, but the weights of a bunch of different people over the country are probably independent. One more example of spatial data. Cases that are in close physical proximity to each other will likely have similar measurements because they share similar environments. For example, temperatures within a county are correlated. So in practice, tracking this assumption involves reasoning through how the data were collected. The consequence of the violation is that we'll make errors in the decisions that we make through statistical inference. That is, we'll make wrong decisions based on p-values and confidence intervals. When this assumption is violated, we need to use specialized statistical methods that are beyond the scope of this course, but are covered in courses that deal with correlated data. The second part of this assumption has to do with our model capturing trends in the data accurately. This part states that the mean of the residuals is zero. In other words, our model captures trends in the data accurately in that the residuals or errors are equally above and below zero. We don't consistently over or underestimate. The spirit of this assumption is that there should be no lingering trends in our residuals. We can check this by plotting the residuals versus the fitted values, which are our predictions from the model. We do this for our housing model, and we see from this plot that when our predictions are high, the right side, the residuals become increasingly positive. That is, we're increasingly underestimating for these types of houses. The actual prices are higher than what we predict. If this assumption were met, the blue smooth trend would be flat it would lie more or less on top of the reference red line at y equals zero. Violations of this assumption indicate that something is lacking in the way that we formulated our model. We can try to fix this by modifying the age predictor to allow for a nonlinear relationship. For example, we might use age squared in the model. We'll explore several ways to handle nonlinearity later in the course. We can also add other predictors to our model to correct the systematic over and underestimation. The third part of the assumption is homoscedasticity, which is a long word that means constant variance. This part says that the standard deviation of the residuals is always the constant value sigma. In other words, it is not the case that the standard deviation of the residuals is one for certain cases and three for others. The variability in the residuals must always be the same. 
We can check this with the same plot we used for checking the trend assumption, plotting the residuals versus the fitted values. This time, we look to see if the points are more spread out vertically in certain regions of the x-axis. This would indicate that the residuals are more variable in some cases than in others. If we look carefully, we can see that the points do seem to be getting more spread out as we look from left to right. So this assumption also seems to be violated. As with the independence assumption, violations of this assumption lead to errors in statistical inference. We can try to fix this by transforming the response variable, say by taking the logarithm. This would bring the outliers more towards the middle, which could reduce the variance of the residuals towards the right of the plot. The last part of the assumption is normality. We assume that the residuals follow a very particular distribution, the normal distribution. Another way to phrase this is that the actual responses in our data are normally distributed around the trend described by our model. We can check this assumption by looking at the distribution of the residuals and seeing if the distribution is shaped like a normal distribution. Histograms and density plots are clear choices for this. We've made a density plot on the left. It's centered a bit to the left of zero and looks right skewed. This doesn't look normal. But what if it doesn't look as bad? Is there a better way than this rough eyeballing of the shape? A better plot for checking whether the shape of the distribution is normal enough is the QQ plot. The QQ plot of our model's residuals is shown on the right. We'll get to how this plot is made in just a second, but in interpreting this plot, we look to see if the points fall on the solid diagonal line. The points show the distribution of our residuals, and the line shows what the points would look like if they were normally distributed. If the residuals were normally distributed, they would fall exactly on top of the line. They don't, however, so we can conclude from both the density and the QQ plot that the residuals are not normally distributed. As with the homoscedasticity assumption, violations lead to errors in statistical inference. We can try to make our residuals more normally distributed by transforming the response variable. How is a QQ plot made? Each point on a QQ plot is determined as follows. We'll pick a percentile value, say the 10th percentile. The X value of a point uses the theoretical shape of a standard normal distribution, which has mean zero and standard deviation one. This is why the X axis is labeled theoretical. We get the X value by asking, for standard normally distributed data, 10% of the values would be less than what value? This value is negative 1.28. To get the y value of a point on a QQ plot, we ask about the same percentile, but this time in our sample. 10% of the values in my sample are less than what value? This value is 96,900. We repeat this process for many different percentile values to get all the points on a QQ plot. The reference line is made using the same procedure as for the x-axis values, except that the normal distribution used is one that matches the mean and standard deviation of the values in the sample. If the residuals from our model were normally distributed, these points would fall on the reference line. Clearly this assumption is violated, so our statistical inferences might be inaccurate. In summary, we've covered the components of the assumptions of linear regression models. We've discussed how to check those assumptions and how to potentially fix our modeling to meet the assumptions. Generally, violations of assumptions will lead to inaccurate statistical inference, that is, inaccurate decision-making based on p-values and confidence intervals.